welcome. Welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Arthi. My name is Melina. Um, we both use they them pronouns, and um, we're doing a little takeover of Jill Sangha. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Um, yeah, a little bit about us. I mean, we have a lot of the same bio. Um, <laughs> we um, know Jill because she was our teacher actually um, at the Community Dharma Leadership Training that True North Insight did. And so we're both graduates from that program. And um, we're both therapists and we both study somatic experiencing. So, um, and we both have a long history in Dharma. Yeah, that's our deepest, deepest, truest love for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're here today um, in Tuckeranto, colonially known as Toronto, and these are the lands of the Anishinaabek, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Chippewa, and Mississauga peoples. Um, so this is part two of a two-part um, talk and practice on upaya, which is skillful means. Um, and so last time we talked about how um, we were using kind of modern somatic experiencing trauma tools to nuance how we might be able to meditate to so that we can meditate skillfully. And then this time we're actually talking about how when we can understand dharma through its original context of animism, ritual, and relationality, it's actually already trauma-informed. Um, so in the insight lineage, which is the lineage that I come from um, and have been practicing in for nearly 20 years, um, that's actually a lineage of some white folks in the U.S. going to India and learning some practices and bringing them back without their full ritual context or ritualized context. Um, and so when those kinds of things happen, when mindfulness is taken out of its, uh, out of its very rich context, um, we end up focusing very, like we end up focusing a lot more on this individualized practice. It kind of becomes like the practice becomes like an anti-anxiety pill or like a um, a self-optimizer, you know, instead of what it's actually meant for, which is our own liberation, but also the liberation of all beings because we're fundamentally, fundamentally connected. Um, and so the reason why we were both really excited about this talk is because we really want to be challenging this idea that this is some kind of individualized psychological practice. It is that but it is for the benefit of all beings. Yeah, okay. And for me, like I, this this became really important to me when I was um, maybe like 10 years into my practice or so. And I went on my first long retreat and I had major, major trauma symptoms show up and it was terrifying. And I ended up quitting the Dharma for a few years because I was so disillusioned. I'd lost all of my faith because I was like, this is supposed to be whole. So if it's whole, why isn't it holding me in this trauma, in all of this big trauma that's coming up? Like, what's the point of this if it can't hold me in the hardest things, you know? And then um, one of my teachers was like, maybe you need to think about somatic experiencing. I did many, many years of that as a client, started training in it, changed my entire life. And so for a while I was like, oh, okay, we just have to impose these like modern trauma tools onto ancient Dharma and then it all works. Great. No problem. And then in the last few years where I've been really immersed in devotional practice, I'm like, oh, it's actually the cultural appropriation of mindfulness that has caused all of these problems, you know, um, for me, um, like in my practice. Yeah. Do you want to say anything more? I mean, I could, but you said it so <laughs> Great. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I, maybe just my own context for those who don't know me, because uh, I'm both rooted in insight, Vipassana, but I was a monastic in the Plum Village tradition too. And so I got to live in a very embedded version of mindfulness where even if we weren't getting explanations of all the rituals and all the spirits that we were working with, it was, it, it was um, a full communal experience. Mm -hmm. And so being raised in as white western uh euro rooted person of individualism i got the experience of dharma as something that's holistic and communal and relational um which was so 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 precious 
And yet there are places where, yeah, I needed further nuancing. And so both the insight and the psychotherapeutic, especially the somatic lenses have really helped me to nuance a lot of stuff that's going to come up in the talk tonight. Um, so I also have my own version of how I came to blend all these things together. Um, yeah. And so we want to start with a chanting practice, um, probably because we love chanting. <laughs> um, but it's also one of the many ways that when we practice in a holistic way, there's always chanting and there's deep, deep um, things happening on many dimensions, as well as all the different things in our bodies that's related to what we're bringing into tonight's practice. So I'm going to screen share. Um, Can you all see this? Oh, I think I'm on the wrong page. Okay, let's get to the right page. Here we go. This is called the different names, but the four boundless qualities. It's a it's a Brahma Vahara chant. Um, just make sure this is in the right view. Page. Yeah. Um, Can you all see it? Seeing some nods. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Sweet. And so I'm just going to explain a little bit about chanting this particular chant. If you're new to this, first of all, you don't have to do anything if you don't feel like it, or if, especially if it feels like deeply a big no from your body, please respect that. That's part of the practice that we're inviting tonight. But if you're either familiar with chanting, then jump in. And if you're curious or wanting to explore and try a little bit, um, the way that this is written out, I know it might be sort of small to see, is that wherever there's a little arrow underneath a, a syllable, that's because the tone goes down. And where there's an arrow above, it's because the tone goes up and there are only three notes. So I'll give the example of, now let us let make the four boundless qualities shine for I will abide. Those are all the notes that we have. So if you want to try chanting along, you're welcome. Um, you can also just forget about the tonality of it and speak it if you'd like to get the experience of the resonance in your body. You can listen to it. You can hum along. You can stay silent. So there's many ways to engage in a chanting practice. Please respect um your boundaries and also if you're willing to be a, a little playful and exploratory um you can approach this really with playfulness and curiosity it's a great way to to jump into this and so we're going to chant this together mm -hmm. um but before we go into the chanting just tune in and notice how your system is um how how is breathing happening What's the state of mind? State of the nervous system. What we would call, how are you doing? <laughs> A brief maybe body scan or just anchoring into this moment, which may include a barrage of whatever you're carrying in from the rest of the day. Seeing what's happening in the body. Emotional tone. And then we're going to chant. And we can continue this interoception, this noticing what's happening within as we chant, if you'd like, as well. Now let us make the four boundless qualities shine for... I will abide pervading one quarter with a heart imbued with loving kindness. 
Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a heart imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide, pervading one quarter, with a heart imbued with compassion, Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a heart imbued with compassion, Abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide, pervading one quarter, with a heart imbued with gladness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a heart imbued with gladness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide, pervading one quarter, with a heart imbued with equanimity. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a heart imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. So we're going to just take another three, four minutes meditation practice, letting this resonance be noticed. How is the body, heart, mind stream now? So we get to notice for ourselves, not just thinking about the words of chanting, but 
What is the experience of chanting ourselves or of listening to these vibrations as well as the meaning of these words? with three sounds of a bell. Wonderful. Okay, so we're going to do just a little bit of a review for folks who didn't come to the first one, just a five minute review. Um, we're, we're talking about trauma today. Um, and so I wanted to define what that is. Peter Levine defines trauma as anything that is too much, too soon, or too fast for our nervous systems to handle especially if we can't reach a successful resolution. And then Melina added a helpful note. Um, also, it's not just too much too soon, um, too fast. It's also not enough for too long. So if you've experienced neglect, abandonment, particularly as a young one, um, that can really um, create trauma in the body. And when I was thinking about not enough for too long, I was also thinking about, you know, the impact of colonization on our bodies, um, where we're so separated from each other and our natural inclination is actually to be together. Um, that's what our, yeah, we are social creatures. And so that's also an impact of um, not enough for too long. Okay, when we're talking about trauma, we're talking about the impact on our nervous system. We're talking about a physiological manifestation. So we're not talking about the incident itself, but how the body perceives it. So Gabbar Mate says trauma from the Greek word wound is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside you as a result of what happens to you. So it's not the blow on the head, but it's the concussion that I get. That makes sense. So it's really about the body. It's not about the war that happened. It's about the impact that that has. So it's not about the war, it's about the flashbacks as like a classical example of trauma. Um, last week, we talked about some trauma-informed principles. We named two of them. They were titration and pendulation. We picked three more for this week and there are many, many, many more trauma-informed principles, but there's only so many things we can do in two hours. Um, so really briefly, um, pendulation is um, like the word, it's like a pendulum that swings kind of back and forth. And so um, we, what we're doing is we're moving our attention from something that's very difficult and maybe even overwhelming to be with to something that's easy to be with. So that that could be something that's neutral or positive. So let's say I've got a horrible pain in my shoulder and, you know, my attention is really focused there because it's, you know, it's a very big sensation. Our, our bodies tend to go where the biggest sensation is. Um, but also because our bodies are brilliant and are always trying to heal. So we always kind of zoom in on what's not working to be like, how do we fix this, right? Brilliant, but we can get overwhelmed. And so we can pendulate by going to like the hand, let's say if the hand is feeling pretty neutral and it has a lot of aliveness in it, we can go there, be with that for a bit, go back to pendulation. So that's pendulation. Titration um, is another trauma-informed mindfulness principle where if, again, if the shoulder is on fire, um, instead of going right into the center of the pain, we take the pain in drop by drop by drop so we don't get overwhelmed by it. So an example of titration would be to just be in the, um, to kind of draw a circle around where the pain in is, is and just stay on the outside perimeter so that we don't go right into it. Um, yeah, so that these are all ways that we can be with what's difficult and not get overwhelmed by it. Um, so Melina and I are actually developing a course on all of this where we get to go into all the deep nerdery we want to go into, which we definitely don't have the time to do here today, um, talking about polyvagal states and um, like fight, flight, freeze, and all we're going to draw all kinds of activation, deactivation charts. It's like our 
it's like deeply, deeply fun for us. Um, and you can find out about that if you sign up for Melina's newsletter, which is on their website. Yeah. Okay. That's my plug. I'm done. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Yeah. Um, and just to share, we had also shared a story from the Lotus Sutra because Upaya, the term that we're holding all this under of skillful means or expedient means is sort of one of the main messages of the Lotus Sutra. And there's a story of children in a burning house. The father is trying to get them out. The kids are like, no, 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 we're playing. We aren't listening. And so the father has to trick them to come out of the house. And um, that's been used as, as a version, not that the Dharma is about tricking people, but sometimes <laughs> that the, the container and the, um, the presentation of wisdom teachings and healing teachings might look very, very different from what we expect or how we've approached them in the past. But if they are expedient, if they are effective, they can still be tools of Dharma, of liberation. And then also sharing Kisa Gotami and the mustard seed, this woman with a baby who's died, who's desperate to revive her baby and um, goes to the Buddha who says, okay, I can help you, but you have to bring a mustard seed from a house where no one's ever died. And she can't. Um, and that's often taught as learning the universality of death. But in it, I also see someone who's experiencing PTSD. And the Buddha didn't sit down and say, okay, I'm going to give you a Dharma talk. You're going to go meditate and just sit with it. I was like, no. Yeah, that that's not helpful right now. Go be with people. Let them hug you. <laughs> let you be with the human agony of this grief. And then a few years later, she became a nun and she became one of the first enlightened nuns because there was a time and place where the, the more formal practices were appropriate and a time and place where they weren't. So for me, that's an inherently trauma-informed <laughs> story from the very, very early days. Um, and so um, the next principle that we want to bring in is that of trusting the body, uh, trusting the nervous system, which is amazingly powerful and very tricky. Um, I think of so much in mindfulness practices has helped me learn to actually notice what's going on so I can know what the messages are of yes and no and stop. But I've also done enough Dharma practice, especially the time I spent as a monastic, where there's a lot of overriding messages of, you know, if you've also done like a Goenka retreat and like, just sit still, sit still for hours and hours and don't move. Um, I've done a few of them. I've really benefited from it. And some people can have psychotic breaks from doing that and can have tremendous pain things that come up that don't resolve. So like, it's, it's a very mixed bag. This, the, the teachings that have a side of overriding basic messages of the body. And this is where I know for so many years, I was like, well, how, how do I know what, when? When is it important to stay with the form and push through? And when is it really not a good idea? And it's all the trauma theory <laughs> and the therapy that's really helped me understand. Oh, okay, like discomfort okay, yeah, I, I, it's a little scary. It's hard. I'm not comfortable. Yeah, we can work with that. We can stay with that. If there's like a burning inside, if there's a like, no, that's not to be overridden. Um, and so it's been a really important nuancing of traditional practices, um, because, especially because when there's trauma, so much of what makes trauma go from say the wound on the head to the concussion or the, the emotionally traumatic experience is when the body's natural attempt to respond, to fight back, to shout, to run away, to ask for support when those natural responses get thwarted or repressed or punished or other variations. Then the trauma itself carries that over it, it teaches us to override mm -hmm. and so if our dharma practices are perpetuating the overriding it's not leading to liberation it's more of the same 
And yet there are variations of not, you know, formally sitting with, but like Arthur was saying with the titration and pendulation and other practices where we can actually be doing the mindful work of staying with, but it doesn't have to be in the very center. It can be on the edge. It doesn't have to be still. It can be walking and fidgeting mindfully. You know, there's, there's ways that we don't have to drop the Dharma principle, but we can adapt how it looks so that it's not perpetuating the trauma patterns. And you might need help figuring out what that means exactly how. A lot of us need help with that. <laughs> but just knowing that it's possible is already, I find incredibly liberating mm -hmm. and part of the excitement of sharing this. Mm -hmm. And I have this little note about I am, I can versus I can't, I have to. Um, it could be the theme of a whole multi-week course also that who knows, maybe someday we'll do also, but the role of, of our attachment or our connections. And I mean, this in a psychological sense, not bad attachment craving <laughs> Dharma, <laughs> um, but, but the fact that we naturally have connections. And so when their teachings, um, trying to make this brief, say, sit with it, stay with it, you, you know, to, to go into something that's difficult or um, to persevere through a challenging type of practice or even, to, you know, to extend loving kindness to your enemies. For some folks, we receive those teachings and it's like, whoa, that was so liberating. And for other folks, it can be like, oh my gosh, I hated that. Or I feel really dissociated. I like bad non-liberating liberating things happen. And what I've realized is that if there is an inner quality of like, I wanna try this, or if we have a relationship with a teacher and there's this sort of energy of like, I know you can do this, this liberation is possible. I can. These, these sort of strenuous practices and big stretches, this is, this is, this is my working hypothesis, um, but it's, it's pretty tested. <laughs> um, it can be really liberating. Whereas if it's coming from an inner sense of like, I'm a bad person. I need to practice to fix myself. Mm -hmm. I can't really do this, but I'm going to push myself anyway. Um, or if there isn't a sense of trust with a teacher and it feels like punishment or judgment, what I see is that that tends to lead what could be liberative practices can often again, perpetuate the trauma or become a further shame spiral and not actually help the liberation. Um, so it's both important to be honest about what kind of relationship we have with our teachers or if we're teaching to like be really respectful that if there isn't a close relationship, we need a lot more care in what's shared how, um, but also for ourselves, like are we approaching challenging practices with a seems kind of exciting there's possibility here which is onward leading but when we're practicing from a, a shame or an obligation or an inferior not just inferiority but like any state of i can't and i use these terms because that actually correspond to polyvagal states of mm -hmm. if we're in sympathetic charge of fight flight if we're in a freeze free states have an i can't um, and we aren't going to go deeply into that, but that's where um, a lot of this nervous system stuff gives a way to track. Oh, when is it helpful to apply this and to not apply that? I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm seeing one thumbs up. That's awesome. I think I'll just share a brief story from a sutta and then pass it on to Arthi. Because okay. um, again, from the early, early canon, uh, the sutta on the better way to catch a snake. Well, it has many stories in it, including the simile of the raft that many of you might know. Um, but also the Buddha said, you know, if people go ahead and try to um, memorize the sutras to win at arguments and debates, to puff themselves up with pride, to just talk about them and discuss them, but never apply them. That's like someone who tries to catch a snake from the tail catch a snake from its tail, it just wraps around you and can bite you. 
these teachings can not just not be effective, but they can hurt us if we don't know how to approach them skillfully. But if we know how to approach those teachings skillfully, learn to apply them, to engage with other sincere practitioners and see if we can come to a shared understanding. Um, apply them for the sake of liberation, not just for arrogance. Um, then it's like someone who knows how to catch a snake and they take a forked stick and they stick out the neck of the, of the snake and hold it there so they can grab the neck and pick it up and not get bitten. And so for both of us, it's the, it's the trauma-informed theory that gives us a tool to know, oh, am I, am I picking up this teaching in a way that's going to bite me? Or maybe our students are going to get bitten. Or are we approaching it skillfully with some caution, some care, and some space <laughs> so that we can find a skillful place and find freedom with these teachings? Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Um, and just to say really quickly around trusting the body. Um, so one of the things about trauma is that it kind of overrides our boundaries, right? It's, it's an intrusion into our personal, into our sense of self. And so trusting the body is an antidote to that intrusion. And so if one of the simple things we can practice is to just pee when we have to pee, how many of us hold our pee for like hours, you know? And so when our body has been in, intruded upon, our body's like, Hey, I don't, I don't trust you, you know? And so one of the ways we can rebuild trust is by actually listening to the body, building a relationship with the body that is kind. So when the body has a need, go with it, you know, in our practice so often we like stillness, stillness, stillness. And again, this is the picking the snake up with the, with the two pronged fork, you know? Um, okay. Sometimes we need to be still and sometimes we need to move and that's okay. You know, trusting the body and that discernment of when do I need to be still and when do I need to move is tricky for sure. But, but what's really great is you could just try it out. You know, the Buddha talked about a go try it out and see for yourself. And it's going to be different in every moment. And that's great. It's play, right? It's play. So you can try, you're going to sit still for a bit and you're going to move a little bit and see how things move there. Um, you know, if you are a neurodivergent person um, and let's say you have ADHD and it's really hard to sit still, great. Then your two-pronged fork is to do walking meditation, you know, or standing meditation, um, or other kind like qigong there's so many ways to be mindful and it's so 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 important to really really trust that that's how the body is designed these are my causes and conditions and i'm going to show up really respecting those causes and conditions yeah then so if you're if you're somebody who stims great stim but stim mindfully know that you're stimming know what it feels like feel how it's helping ease your nervous system and you can really deeply respect and and even have um, so much appreciation for how your body's naturally uh, has created um, these movements to allow you to calm down. So beautiful. Yeah. Great. Okay. Co-regulation. So um, the, the second principle we're going to talk about today is co-regulation. Um, and this is the idea that our energies are contagious. We all know this, right? You're a bit grumpy. You go to a friend's house. You're like, I'm grumpy and they're in a pretty good mood. And then over time you start kind of feeling better. The energy is contagious. Our nervous systems are designed to speak to one another. Um, and, um, and that's really, really important. We are, we are collective creatures. We're social creatures. We need each other. So Ananda, the loyal attendant of the Buddha, um, you know, asked the Buddha one day, is spiritual friendship, you know, half of the path? And the Buddha said, no, actually it's the whole of the path. So when we're talking about sangha, about community, this is so essential that it's literally in the triple jewels. It's what in the triple jewel, it's what we take refuge in. That's how essential it is. Yeah. And people are tricky, right? <laughs> we want to co-regulate with people and then we're like, oh God, oh, this is not, you're not just all sunshine and rainbows. It's really hard to co-regulate with you. So we can co-regulate with pets, right? So many of us will just like pet a cat, pet a dog and feel so much better, um, and we can also co-regulate with um, 
with our ancestors. We can bring them into our practice. We can co, we, you know, I very often will ask my wise and well ancestors to sit next to me in my practice as a way that I'm building a container when I'm starting my sitting practice, because quite frankly, sitting with what's here is sometimes terrifying, right? <laughs> like I actually need a bunch of support. And so I'll ground with the earth and I'll, I'll start building a container that way. And then I, you know, notice the strength in my back and then I'll land in the softness of my heart. And that's all a way that I build a container. And then I ask my ancestors to sit next to me. I might bring in some of my benefactors in my metta practice um, to come hang out with me in front of me. And every time I do a sitting practice, I ask Kuan Yin, the Bodhisattva of compassion, to um, put her arm at my back or to put her hand at my back and I let myself feel into the pressure of that and the heat of her hand and really allow myself to feel it. And this is not me just using my imagination. This is literally Kuan Yin coming here. Like I really fundamentally believe that, that I am asking her to, call, to come here and be with me. So this is not some psychological trick. This is Dharma, you know? Um, okay. And so when we're in relationship with ancestors, with benefactors, with bodhisattvas, like all relationships, they need to be reciprocal. You don't want to be that crappy friend who like is constantly calling and being like, I have a problem, I have a problem, I have a problem. You know, <laughs> you want to be in reciprocal relationship. You want to be in trusting relationship. And the way that we do that is we build altars, right? And we offer items on our altar. We put flowers on the altar. We put water on the altar. We'll build an, we'll have an ancestor plate. We'll have an ancestor altar where we're um, in deep gratitude for these beings, for all that they're offering us right now and in the past, mm -hmm. for the training that they're offering us to be future ancestors and, fu and current, hopefully on the path bodhisattvas. It's really important. You know, the first teaching that the Buddha offered was on generosity, on dana. And it's so important that we are constantly um, offering that. And what's really important to me about this is that we are physically doing it. We are what we practice. We aren't what we think. We are what we practice, right? And so if we, we can think about, oh yeah, interdependence, that's a cognitive concept. But when we're actually practicing interdependence, practicing relationality by actually inconveniencing ourselves by having to go get some flowers and put them on the altar, we're practicing relationality, you know? This is a very small antidote to colonialism. You know, it's a very small antidote to hyper individualism and it has an impact. Like, like it is, it has a huge impact, you know, and it lets us know we're not alone. Like when we're doing, when we're doing these co-regulation practices in Buddhism, like, um, like bowing, um, prostration practices, right. Where we're bowing down to the earth so much of trauma, um, when we get caught in trauma, so much of it is this kind of like, I, me, mine energy, right? My trauma is so big. And that is, of course, of course that's happening, right? Trauma is so overwhelming. So there's nothing wrong with that, but it, but it also causes a lot of suffering. I, me, and mine is kind of is, is like the center of what creates the mental proliferations, you know? And so when we're in these practices of honoring, when we're in these practices of bowing down and humbling ourselves and getting really small, and we're in, in appreciation of the vastness of creation, of the vastness of dharma, we're like, oh, I, me, mine is actually pretty teeny tiny, you know? So again, another antidote to the overwhelming feelings of trauma. And this is all co-regulation. Like when we're doing those prostrations on our own, beautiful practice, but I'm sure you've all done this in a group, right? And it's this collective energy that gets created. I have goosebumps actually just thinking about it. Um, that gets created that is so undeniable where we're all helping each other's nervous system. So if mine, if I'm feeling a bit sluggish, but I'm in a group of 30 people all prostrating, suddenly I have a bunch of energy. And we can even do that on Zoom. Like we all had experiences of that through the pandemic, right? Um, still having these collective experiences. And we do this in our in our secular culture too. We go to concerts, right? We go to like sports stadiums. Like we know about part regular- Doing the wave. Doing the wave, yes. <laughs> yes, an embodied yeah. experience, not just a still experience, but a movement experience. Okay, I could talk about this for a long time, but we got to move on. Um so I really um, 
I wanted to tell a story because we're doing a little Sutta story for every principle. Um, and I really like how this podcaster, Joshua Michael Shri from the Emerald podcast, um, reimagines the story of Buddha's awakening as one of an interdependent ecology, which I think is kind of inherently about co-regulation. So I just typed it up as is because it was so beautiful. I just wanted you to hear it. The full story of the Buddha's awakening isn't just a story of a lone person meditating with his own mind. The full story has an ecology to it. To remember the full story is to remember the tree under which the Buddha sat and the shape of the people leaf, which I've heard is the same shape as the mouth makes as it makes its journey through the Om sound. We need the story of the tree with all its leaves a humming and the vast cosmos reeling about that tree. We need the serpent, which coiled about the Buddha and sheltered him from the storm. We need his dark skin. We need his ribs sticking out like branches, rising and falling with breath, wet with morning dew. We need the sweet rice milk felt, fed to him by Sujata when he had almost given up. We need the morning star of realization and his hand gently touching the earth. The story of why you're sitting is not just a story of you. It has trees in it and serpents and bitter tears at the suffering of existence. It has other beings in it and their welfare and the welfare of a cosmos and an endless cycle of living and dying. That's why you take a seat, not just for you, for the living welfare of the universe. The Buddha wasn't using mindfulness practice to gain something. He was existence breathing itself in full knowledge of itself. And the world bowed and flowers fell. Awakening in inspires devotion and devotion inspires awakening. They aren't two separate things. Mm -hmm. oh, someone calls these truth tears crying from like the beauty of the truth. Yeah. So I'm going to share just a little bit more about resourcing and one more story. And then we're going to close with a meditation that Arthi will guide around 830. We'll see. It might be a little longer. And if anyone wants to stay for conversation, we will do that. But we will close for those also who, you know, this is enough or it's bedtime. So I'm going to share about resourcing which is another term that we find from trauma theory and uh, trauma therapy practices. Um, resources are things or practices that engage an embodied sense of safety and support, which is the opposite of what trauma leaves us experiencing. Um, or my our, our, our teacher for somatic experiencing, Deep Parsonishi, says resourcing is what allows us to stay with what we felt we couldn't stay with in the past. It's not necessarily what, about feeling good, but it gives us greater capacity, which I mean, what is the Dharma doing other than giving us greater capacity to be with what is, and especially the hard stuff. And this can be anything from, maybe there's a fluffy blanket that when you touch it and wrap it around, it kind of, oh, feel a little soothed, but you also feel a little more capable. A lot of people looking at the sky, there's things that we can do through the external senses. But there's also, you know, calling in a loving grandparent or a spiritual teacher into our minds. These are resources as understood through therapy. Um, and most of psychotherapy and Western modalities have it as a pretty individualistic practice. You may call in the grandparent, but it's still you doing it. Um, Whereas when we are coming to the Dharma in a holistic way, there's a whole cosmology, there's a whole worldview that, that is offered as resource. And it's not just in Dharma. I think every wisdom tradition um, has variations of here's, here's the cosmos and here's your place. And, and that works against the individualism that so many of us have been raised with that I think causes tremendous anxiety and depression and despair and aggression um, because our, our psyches are not meant 
to, to think that we're having to figure out how to do it all alone. And as the same podcast, Arthi mentioned, um, the, the podcaster had said really beautifully, like, if we are left with an individualistic worldview, we will either at some point feel like we have to fix everything ourselves or nothing matters and there's nothing I can do. And both those extremes are incredibly distressing and they're also nowhere near liberation. Um, and so our worldview is also a resource. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um and also things like chanting and bowing and walking. Those are, those are also resources. I know for both of us are quite um, committed to chanting practice. And, and sometimes it's, it's to uplift. And sometimes it's, I don't know how I can get through the day. We've had a lot of these moments. Okay, let's just do a few rounds of chanting. And then for some reason, 10 minutes later, yeah, I can get through this. Can you? Yeah. Um. And so specific practices can be resources, but so is knowing that there are ancestors, people who've come before us, even if we don't know them, who've gotten through similar difficulties, who have resilience, who have learned, who have shared, um, who've simply survived. Um, that's for some, some of us, a very direct form of resource. Knowing that the earth is holding us can be resource. The air of the cosmos is breathing us as resource, our spiritual lineages as resource. I know sometimes I'll even visualize sort of 2,600 years of teachers, students, benefactors, even the practitioners who jumbled it and bumbled it and were just bad, mean people. <laughs> They're part of lineage too. <laughs> Not just the awakened sages and saints, you know, I'm like, okay, they all have a place. I have a place too. <laughs> um, there's many ways to find resource beyond the material sensory realm and beyond the individual. In fact, I think it's vital um, where, again, if we're practicing within an embedded holistic context, um, I practice both Theravada and Mahayana. Uh, traditions and even in the Theravada tradition that so many Western Anglo folks can think of as not having any religion <laughs> until you read the suttas <laughs> people just talking to devas and Brahma gods and all left and right there is just beings in other realms everywhere mm -hmm. there's no question that this is an animate cosmos um, and then in the Mahayana suttas it goes even gets even richer <laughs> and more developed um, where we have the Indra's net of the entire cosmos. Every knot, a jewel that reflects every other jeweled knot. Um, and so this is not just the, the beauty of the possibility that we can find within an animate uh, interconnected worldview as resource. It's also an honesty that if we uh, if we don't intentionally cultivate what is our worldview in cosmology, um, again, the way this podcaster put it uh, is the dangers of sitting with a postmodern mind and letting it cartwheel through its neuroses is the reification and amplification of neurotic self-involved thoughts. It's almost impossible to not be very self-involved with an individualistic worldview. And it's very hard to actually tap into resource when we feel and understand ourselves as separate, solitary beings. And it's almost impossible to act in any way that's for the good of all beings when we understand ourselves as separate. And so I'm going to close um, with uh, a story of Avalokiteshvara Kuan Yin. Um, that my good friend Casey Lin received directly from her teacher, Master Zhen Ru, uh, just last year. And it's a variation of a story some of you may have also heard. So one day, Avalokiteshvara, also known as Guan Yin, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, that Arthi mentioned earlier, had spent thousands of years saving infinite sentient beings. And on this day, Avalokiteshvara realized 
that the sentient beings in samsara were neither increasing nor decreasing. Having exerted such a tremendous effort, but still seeing infinite sentient beings to be saved, Guan Yin became discouraged. They thought to themselves, how can I ever save all the sentient beings? This is an impossible task. And they broke their aspiration for bodhicitta dwindled, their intention to awaken for the sake of all beings and to help all beings to awaken that it, it, uh, it dissolved. They slowed their efforts and finally they broke their vow and they were heartbroken. As a result of that heartbreak, their head split into 10 pieces and their body completely shattered. At that moment, the root guru Amitabha, known as another Buddha, had knew that something had gone awry, entered into Bodhisattva Samadhi and saw what had happened to Avalokiteshvara, to Guan Yin. Tearfully, Amitabha said to Guan Yin, you have worked so hard. Sentient beings feel infinite and your ability is so finite, but I am here. And Amitabha then pieced Guan Yin together. Each piece tenderly held, soothed, and transformed into what we now know as the thousand-armed, thousand-eyed Guan Yin who is able to address thousands and thousands of beings at once with 10 faces and Amitabha's head on top of their own. <laughs> and so even in our heartbreak, we can actually find the medicine that we need. And I'm gonna let Arthi close us with a practice. We have six minutes, which, which means, should we just, I'll just, I just don't wanna rush it. Can we invite that if anyone wants and needs to leave, please feel free to do so now. And if you can stay for meditation, you're welcome. Yeah, it'll be a 10 minute practice. So we'll be, I guess, six minutes over if that feels okay. Um, yeah, and then there'll be time for questions. Thank you so much for your kind to kind attention um, to our nerdery. <laughs> I will put the Donna link into the chat because some of you might be leaving right now, but we'll just, I'll just do that silently after this. Perfect. Okay. So finding your posture that might be sitting, standing, lying down, walking, movement, whatever, really trusting the body, whatever the body is saying is the right thing to do here. And so in this practice, we'll weave together some of these elements um, that we've been talking about. Our, our screen is very fuzzy. It's weird. Ah. Okay. So noticing, we'll start by building a container, container as a resource. So noticing the parts of your body that are being supported by the earth. That might be your sits bones and your thighs. Perhaps your feet are touching the earth. Maybe your back body is being supported by a chair or couch. Let's see if you can let yourself sink in just a little bit more to the earth, knowing that you didn't have to do anything at all to receive this support. It's just here. Allowing yourself to feel the downward pull of gravity. knowing that that is the earth calling us home into belonging. And 
And then while feeling that downward energy, see if you can feel into the upward energy of the spine. You can imagine that there's a, a little string at the top of your head and there's a fairy very, very gently pulling that string. So you can feel the full strength of your back. Noticing the width of the back as well. From the shoulders to the low back. There is a strength here. And then landing in the heart. Noticing the heart space. Given the support of the earth and the strength of the back, see if you can find some softness here. Landing in the breath. And so as we know, the world is really on fire. There are hurricanes and there are genocides and there is a U.S. election coming up and there are much, much, much dukkha. And see if your body can feel that. If it feels like it's too much to feel, please open your eyes and resource with what's happening outside of the body and you can pendulate you can be with what's outside as well as be with what's inside trusting that if it's too much there are many other times to practice but if you can be with the dukkha of the world and the suffering stay with it noticing the sensations of the dukkha. Does it have a temperature? Is it fast moving or slow moving? Does it have a sinking feeling or a contraction? Remembering at any time you can be with the earth as a way to pendulate or be with the strong back. It is a very, very, very difficult time right now to be alive. And so where you most feel this pain, this dukkha, you might want to place a hand there. And this hand isn't to make the pain go away but it's to support it. It's to say, I see you. I'm here for you. And you can imagine the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Guan Yin, or Avalokiteshvara. You can call her in right now to our practice. And we're going to ask her to place one of her thousand hands on our back body, opposite to where, we're, where our hand is. So if your hand is on your belly, she'll have her hand on your low back. So you're creating a little sandwich, a hand, body, hand, sandwich. And Navalokiteshvara can hold the cries of the entire universe. Letting yourself feel the warmth of her hand and the pressure. 
feeling into the ways that your hand and her hand can support you in being with this pain and bearing witness. And just as Avalokiteshvara can hold us, she can also hold the pain of the world. And so we can imagine one hand in the U.S. holding the survivors of the two hurricanes. And another one of her arms is in Palestine, holding the people, the land, the displaced animals. Another hand is in Sudan. Another one in Congo. And again, if at any point this feels overwhelming, open your eyes, trust the body, ground into the earth. And another hand at Myanmar. Remember that she's still holding your back Letting yourself feel that pressure, that warmth. Noticing her half smile as she listens at ease to the cries. Another hand in Tibet. A hand in Kashmir. A hand for all of the indigenous people in Turtle Island and beyond. A hand for the earth itself being ravaged by environmental degradation. Knowing that pain connects us all, that first noble truth, and also the arms of Kuan Yin, the embodiment of compassion, also connects all of us. And we'll just rest for a moment with Kuan Yin's arm at our, with Kuan Yin's hand at our back, body and our hand on our front body, resting into that nurturing sandwich. May we know that feeling into collective pain is a part of our collective liberation. May we learn to practice skillfully for the liberation of all beings. May there be peace, may there be peace, may there be peace. Thank you, friends. Thank you. I'll stop the recording here.